Hey, how's it going? Jason here. And today we're going to head over to uh, Dr. Tom Elias' house, uh, the former uh, director at the U.S. National Arboretum, and we're going to check out his extensive stone collection. Good morning, Jason. Hi, Tom. How's it going? Good to Great. see you again. So let me just introduce you to some of our collection, and we'll start from there in our living room okay. with some of our stones from different countries. Uh, we have some smaller stones uh, here, including a couple of uh, uh, cherry blossom stones and a plum flower stone. And uh, in this larger shelf, we have stones from various countries, including a piece of turquoise from China. Oh, that's very pretty. A structure stone from Taiwan. Okay. A ying stone from uh, southern China. A nice chrysanthemum flower stone from Japan, even a Gobi Desert stone from China, a piece of jasper. Oh, very pretty. Very nice piece. And uh, we have a piece of basaltic rock from Vietnam. I mean, from this is from uh, Indonesia, from Sumatra, hmm. Western Sumatra. Yeah. Uh, several from Vietnam. This is one of them, very hard, black. Uh, stone, nice features. Okay. Base was made in Vietnam. Uh, and you can see here the, the whole range of stones that we have. Two very nice stones, landscape type stones from the Burian Alps in northern Italy. Oh, wow. Very beautiful stones. And over here, I have one of my favorite stones. This is a natural Chinese Taihu stone. Most people never get, never see a natural taihu stone. And you can tell it's natural by the surface, it's rough, the roughness, the texture. This is the type of taihu stone that most people see and represent maybe 80 or 90% of the taihu stones on the marketplace. This has been uh, polished, but sandblasted. Usually there's additional, additional holes made into it and in China, the Taihu stones were prized back in the very early, in the, in the Song Dynasty and Ming Dynasty. And the demand was so great that they exhausted the supply of them from Lake Tai. So they get them from other areas now, and they get pieces of, of light-colored limestone and carve them to look like the old one. And look at a few more smaller stones in the collection. Uh, this is a Sano Island stone from Japan. It's been oh, uh, look, look at the colors. Prize for many years. Nice colors into it. Uh, this stone from Xi'an in China has these three uh, calcite inclusions in it, but it it really is the Chinese characters for river. Oh, <laughs> or three. I want to show you a, a really nice Chinese stone. <clears throat> that we got recently, and we had the base made by one of the leading uh, stone carvers, wood carvers in China, in Shanghai, uh, Mr. Sh Mr. Xin. And we took this stone, it's a Julong B stone from Fujian province, very hard, dense stone with nice green, blue colors. And instead of having a traditional base made for it, he made a base that it's a combination of a base and display stand. Mm. And it's a, he it's very modern style approach so that uh, you don't have to have both a base and a, a display stand. Here are two uh, Japanese stones with traditional Japanese bases. Japanese bases tend to be simpler and uh, not as elaborate as the Chinese bases, and they're subordinate to the stone because the Chinese or the Japanese would like for you to eye to go to the, to the stone okay. first and then the base. Mm. For some Japanese stones, like this Faria stone, uh, this is an older Faria stone. It has a more elaborate base carved by uh, Koji Suzuki, one of the premier base makers in Japan. This is one of his very early bases he made before he uh, turned 
professional. This particular stone is, has a name clouds coming and going. So when you look at this stone, you just see the white part, it's like clouds moving across oh, right. the front range of a mountain. Yeah, I see that. And if you spend much time in the mountains, you can see clouds moving in and moving along the lower slopes. Of so what, what kind of features should we look for when we're looking at stones? Well, this Japanese stone from the Kama River is a classic type of stone because it's mountain shaped, it has a tall peak, it slopes down uniform, fairly uniformly on all sides, front and back. So that's good. The material is very hard. I think it's basalt. And the texture. This is uh, a little rough texture, but a lot of Japanese stone connoisseurs prefer a rough texture of stone mm. rather than the very smooth ones. And it has a natural bottom. The base is subtle and supports it. So it has a good shape, form, color, composition, and texture. So this uh, stone has all the features an outstanding stone. This is an older stone. It's probably been used in Japanese tea ceremony and in the waiting room and is just a fabulous Japanese type stone. Do you have some stones in your collection that maybe aren't as, uh, don't have all the features so we can kind of compare the difference? Yeah, here's another Japanese stone. This one is from Hokkaido. It's Kamimukotan from the Ishikari River. And this is a waterfall stone hmm. where you have a a quartz or calcite inclusion oh, yeah. in the stone that looks like a waterfall. Yeah. So on the front, it's very attractive, mm. but the stone doesn't slope backwards. It's fairly flat. Oh. So the overall shape of the stone is not uh, as good as it could be. Okay. If it sloped back like this, it would make a fantastic stone if it was this shape. So while this is a very nice stone to look at, in the overall quality, it's not as good as the first stone we looked at. Now, most people, when you read about stones and look at stones, think of them as serious things that you contemplate. You sit and study and you, you vision what it means and you write poetry or paint it. But if you look at both at the Chinese literature in the Ming Dynasty, they talk about playful stones, hmm. stones that were more for not so serious in nature and to uh, more lighter in nature. And th here are two examples of what I call playful stones. Uh, one is this Ligurian, Italian Ligurian stone that looks like a dog. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> and this Murphy stone from California that looks like a bird or hawk. Oh, wow. And even the, uh, we learned from a Japanese tea master that in Japan, the people doing calligraphy and serious writing would sometimes take a break and they would look at a stone they call eye resting stone. Oh. So it's not so serious. It's to take a break, look at something lighter, more amusing. Oh. And so these are examples of what I call playful stones. This one's been on exhibit and been exhibited in Europe and in Japan and North America. Okay, Tom, what do you have for us here? Here are two of my favorite Japanese chrysanthemum flower stones. Uh, they're found in five places in Japan. Wow. These are both from Neo Valley of Gipu. This one has been uh, polished, but you can see that the flowers stand out so clearly with this pink center and rays. Yes, they do. Uh, this is one of the, the best ones I've seen. And this is a natural Japanese chrysanthemum flower stone. These are three dimensional mineral formations oh, yeah. that formed long ago, about 250 million years ago in the shallow uh, sea floor and were uplifted. But here are two examples of very nice uh, Japanese chrysanthemum flower stones. And actually our first book that uh, my wife and I did were on chrysanthemum flower stones. The okay. story of stone flowers. If you're interested in chrysanthemum flower stones, we rec I highly recommend this book. <laughs> it's the only book in English that covers the Chinese, Japanese, Korean and North American chrysanthemum flower stones. Oh wow. This is my stone room where we have some of our stones and part of our library. We have an extensive library on uh, stone, stone appreciation literature. This is a very unusual, very, very nice Chinese stone. 
It's called Lao Shan Green. It's from the uh, bay in the ocean in Shandong province. And it has a greenish color. And this stone, uh, I believe this stone dates back to the Qing dynasty. Oh. But, and the reason I say that is on the back, there's an, in, an inscription uh, that can be read as 1840. Also, on the bottom, there's a Chinese character here uh, that stands for uh, Guangxi or Guang, or, or tribute stone or spirit stone, saying this stone is of high quality, good enough to present to a scholar or a Buddhist monk or somebody important. Later, uh, it was inscribed here uh, with additional characters, which means green stone. I think that stone was inscribed at two different times during mm. its history. Okay. But wow. it looks old, judging by the patina and that it's it's an older stone. So I truly believe it's a Qing Dynasty uh, stone. I'll show you the first two stones I acquired. <laughs> I would like to see those. <laughs> when I when I became the director of the National Arboretum. Uh, 26 years ago, mm -hmm. I was presented with a, uh, a little stone by a member of the board of directors of the National Bonsai Foundation. This is a little piece of granite huh. from Maryland, and it was my first uh, stone. Wow. Then, uh, uh, within a few months later, I was in Japan at the Kokofu Ten, and I purchased this stone. I thought, boy, this is a fabulous stone. I've never seen one of these in nature. Mm -hmm. And it's a Japanese hut stone. And I brought it back and I was at a meeting and I was showing this off when somebody said, oh, you know, they make these. I said, what? <laughs> and so uh, these stones are still very popular in, in Japan today for, for visitors purchasing them. Yeah, and these good. stones come from the Ibi River. And if, here are two stones, natural stones, from the E.B. River. If you go out there, you can find these. And if you simply carve this away, mm. you can end up with a stone that looks something like this. I see. And you can shape it if you want to. Yeah. So you do find a lot of stones that are carved or enhanced in Japan and China. Uh, in fact, in the early Chinese literature of a thousand years ago, they described how the Chinese were modifying stones. So a natural stone was not a, a, a requirement for, mm. for a nice viewing stone in either China or Japan. Although there are people who prefer natural stones. Tom, I wanted to thank you for the tour, but um, I wanted to ask you one last question. Yes. Um, you know, for our viewers, uh, what would you recommend as resources if they wanted to learn more about stone appreciation? Oh, uh, uh, I think the best resource uh, that I can recommend, other than our books that we, three books we've published, is to visit our website. Uh, it's www.bsana, B-S-A-N-A dot org, O-R-G. It's a very comprehensive site that treats stones from around the world. Over a thousand photographs of stones from many different countries and book reviews, articles, featured articles. It's a, a great website and we update it every month and new material. All right, so we're all wrapped up here at Tom Elias' house. Um, he showed us his vast collection of stones. If you're, um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, you're welcome to visit his website, uh, vsana.org. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching.